Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hi, I'm Shabby Singh from Fox Sports and uh, obviously a former Malaysian international and you're listening to the Bola Bola Show. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show. It's me, Steven, again and we've got another interesting episode coming up this week. But before that, I need to bring in my two co-hosts. First and foremost, Bala, how's it going? Uh, not so good day. I think uh, my wow, team Juventus wow. has been uh, defeated by the mighty Porto again. But... Ah, ouch! Yeah, but they're not 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 bad. Uh, Pepe did well the game, and then thanks for the ouch, Elvin. Care to introduce yourself? Yeah, I am Elvin here, and you know, yep, indeed a very painful night for Juventus last night, and uh, you know, we, uh, let's look forward, let's look ahead for this episode yeah, today. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, guys, today on our show, you know, we have a very colourful personality, you know, with a very decorated career in the Malaysian League. You know, he played for Johor, Pahang, Negeri Sembilan, Perak, and of course, you know, the most successful KL team ever. Uh, he was also part of our national team setup in the 80s and 90s. So, mm. here we at the Bola Bola show today are honoured to have Mr. Serbaget Singh, or formerly known as Shabby Singh on our show today. Hello, Hey, Shabby. guys. Hi, Sivan. Hi, Alvin. Hi, Bala. Hello, Shabby. Hi, sir. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I promise you nothing but calling a spade a spade. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so, Shabby. Yeah. Okay. We are so happy to have you on board. And Shabby, maybe you want to just let our listeners know like what projects are you currently involved in these days? Oh, uh, well, um. For almost uh, a year plus now, I have mm-hmm. been actually managing a mechanical engineering firm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a very, very small house. Uh, we do a lot of maintenance uh, work uh, in uh, the plants in Pasir Gudang, in Tanjong Langsat, in Johor. I obviously uh-huh. reside in, uh, in uh, Johor, in JB now, mm-hmm. uh, kind of Balik Kampung. Uh, mm. And uh, yeah, and uh, obviously, you know, with uh, the pandemic and all, uh, work is... Uh, from home, uh, do a few shows uh, for Fox Sports. I've done uh, Generation Gap. I've done Serie A uh, via Skype. So yeah, I mean you know life goes on. Yeah, and and indeed something new for all our listeners today. Shabby and a mechanical engineering firm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. I mean you know it's it's yeah. it's something that I know absolutely nothing about. But <laughs> okay. uh, I I always believe you know um, you know if you don't know you ask. Yes, so I, I would I would say you know that uh, there's a lot of people who have been very helpful, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, yeah you know uh, the company is uh, company is doing well I would say. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So interesting, yep. interesting. So we are we're going to start back at your career. Of course, everyone we all know that you started as a Johorian. You started your career with Johor in the late 70s to the mid 80s. Um, but I want to ask you, how proud are you seeing what JDT is these days? What have they accomplished compared to the Johor team of your time? Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, you know, uh, you talk about uh, different times, you know. Uh, and uh, during my time, yes, uh, the only, uh, we played at Luckin Stadium. We not only played at Luckin Stadium, we trained every day uh, at Luckin Stadium. We lived in Luckin Stadium. When I say we lived in Lakin Stadium, because uh, I, I, I come from Keluang, you know, my hometown is Keluang. So it was pretty much spending six months in Johor Bahru uh, mm-hmm. because at that time we only had one competition, which was uh, the, the league, which was called the Malaysia Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then six months, uh, you went home, you know, and I played for my, my uh, I would say my employer at that time, uh, Lembaga Electric Negara or TNB. Or uh, as their sports clubs used to be known as Kilak Club, um, yeah, I mean you know it, it's just uh, a total transformation, you know. And uh, I must say that you know when you get uh, the right um, people in charge, the right person hates it, uh, TMJ, uh, the Crown Prince, you know. Um, but but I, I must say that you know we we did we did as uh, as well as we could. Uh, I started in 1978 uh, through till uh, 1983, uh, uh, but we never got anywhere near the quarterfinals because the top eight in the league used to go into the Malaysia Cup uh, quarterfinals. Uh, we, we never quite made it there, but I must say that you know it was a, um, it was a wonderful education. 
you know, we had some very, very good personalities in our team. I mean, one Jama, you know, uh, yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah. was 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 uh, playing for Johor at that time. Hassan Yahya, Ramli Mahmud. Uh, don't forget S. Sujindran, you know, Kana, as we used to call him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so, like I said, you know, it was a different time, a different era. Um, but we fought for the shirt. Uh, we, we did our very, very best. Uh, and... Um, uh, I became a full international playing for Johor. Uh, so I was already into my second year playing, uh, playing for Malaysia, which, which is the end of the 83 season. Then I moved to Kuala Lumpur. Hmm. Okay. So from south to center. So basically you went to KL. So we were the part of the untouchable KL team who won three Malaysia Cups in a row and all against Kedah. Uh, what was it like to what, how would you like to play in that team, actually? I mean, I must say that, you know, uh, I was very lucky because in 1985, uh, Dr. Yusuf Vanglosh uh, came to coach Kuala Lumpur. So, 85, you know, we played in the Malaysia Cup final. We lost. And then, 86, uh, we went, almost went unbeaten uh, uh, through the league. Uh, we only lost one game in the league. But in the quarterfinals, we got knocked out. Uh, and then 87, 88, 89 uh, was when we won uh, the Malaysia Cup three times in a row. Uh, we won uh, the double in uh, 88, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, just to be part of such an exciting project, you know, Dr. Yusuf Vanglosh, Tan Sri Ilyas Omar, Mr. S. Subramaniam, Mr. K. Rasalingam, you know, uh, it, was, it was really phenomenal it was like you know it's like it was like being the jdt of of today at that time we had all the best players in malaysia play for kuala lumpur we had all the best uh, three best singaporeans playing for kuala lumpur and i mean the brand of football we played you know was 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 of a different level was of a different standard was of a different class mhm and, uh, you know, Shabby, uh, you know, as what you just mentioned uh, earlier about uh, Dr. Joseph Wengloss, you know, how was it like playing under him, you know, and uh, how did he transform you into becoming a libero? I mean, he was just so advanced in, in, his, in his way of thinking, in his, in his um, you know, uh, in how he saw football, how he, how he saw football evolving. So I had pretty much, you know, uh, come to play for Kuala Lumpur uh, as a central midfielder. Uh, but uh, Dr. Venglos decided that, you know, being a central midfielder, if I played at centre-back uh, as, as a libero, when we had the ball, I would move into midfield and I would be, you know, very, very comfortable in that position. When we lost the ball, I would come back, you know, uh, into a, a libero's position. Uh, uh, you know, so so that for me was like, wow, you know, this this is this is looking way ahead uh, of, of football, and uh, and since since that time, you know, it was always for me, it was always thinking about you know what happens next, you know, where do you go next, you know, and that is when I analyze football, you know, I might, you know, not, I I I'm not your conventional uh, uh, football person, you know. I, I will say things, you know, you may agree or disagree now, but a week, two weeks later, you're going to say, oh, that chappy was right again. So for me, with Dr. Vanglosh, it was like, you know, as a libero, I actually, Dr. Vanglosh actually had two players on the pitch. He had me as a libero. He had me as a, as a central midfielder when we had the ball. So for me, it was like, wow, you know, opening up a new world. I mean, uh, we, we heard so much of great uh, positive thing about Joseph Wengloss when we had our podcast episode with uh, Mr. Lin Tiong Kim, you know, he, as what he mentioned. But Joseph Wengloss was just way ahead of his time. Um, and, but in terms of playing as a libero, I mean, what are the must-have traits that a player should have in order to be good at that position? Well, um, most importantly, you need to have uh, composure. And, and, and to have composure you need to be able to read the game. You need to be able to anticipate what is going to happen next, you know. And that is why, you know, when you are playing as a libero, you're a free man, uh, you have a free role either in midfield or uh, in defence. It is about your sense of anticipation, you know. And uh, also, you need to have great organisational skills. 
which means once again, you know, you don't just look at where the ball is going. You have this big picture of where it's going to go next or, you know, where it's going to go in, 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 uh, in, in, in the third pass. So you need to read these situations. You need to anticipate them and you need to make sure that your teammates are in tune, you know. And, and, and it was for me, it was, you know, very much of a thinking game. And that was something that uh, Dr. Venglosh uh, encouraged me to do. Uh, and on the pitch, sometimes I had to make decisions, you know, I had to like pull somebody, uh, you know, into another position or, you know, get somebody to, you know, to, to switch flanks. So it was a lot of, uh, a lot of freedom of thought on the pitch and Dr. Venglosh encouraged that. And for me, you know, I mean, I wish somebody else was saying this about me, but all, all through the years, you know, every time, you know, people say something about it, it's like, oh, Dear Pandai Bacha game, Pandai Bacha game. I wonder what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, and and you know, and Shabi, why why do you think the libero position? Uh, we don't really see this much happening in the modern game these days. No, football evolves. You know, football mm -hmm. evolves, and uh, from the libero, they converted that libero into a sweeper which meant that you never left uh, your defense, you know? So, so, so it was like, you know, uh, they decided, uh, I mean, like you decided to play with a defensive midfielder or two uh, defensive midfielders or holding midfielders. So you had the sweeper just being the sweeper per se. And then today you look at that, you know, a lot of teams play with three at the back and the guy right in the middle is the sweeper literally, you know, sweeping up behind uh, his, his uh, uh, centre-backs, you know. So there's not so much encouragement uh, to go uh, into midfield. So, so today, centre-backs are not encouraged. I mean, they're not encouraged to venture into midfield so much as uh, the Libero's position uh, did. So, so like I said, I mean, football evolves and uh, you evolve accordingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, Shabi, you were you were part of that you know Malaysian national team squad that won the Sea Games in uh, 1989 on the home soil. So, you know, what was that feeling? And you know, would you elaborate about the team spirit during that time? Oh, you know, we had a we had a crazy team. We had uh, the best from Kuala Lumpur, and we had the best from Selangor, uh, forming the backbone of that team. And when I say crazy, I say it in, in, in the best possible sense, you know, because mm -hmm. when you have such a talented group, or, you know, a, a, a talent of individuals who are extremely, extremely good, with, they are the best in that position, you know, in what they do. And then you all come together and, you know, it was just, you know, like, like, um, to put it in simple words, it's like you play with your eyes closed because everybody knows what, you are going to do everybody knows what you are thinking and you know and uh, for me i think the key uh, to winning that gold medal was it was one week before the sea games kicked off uh, everton uh, came to play a friendly in uh, in uh, kuala lumpur in Merdeka stadium mm -hmm. and uh, after 90 minutes it was a goalless draw i mean this is the everton team of you know if 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 not for hazel this Everton team would have played in the European Cup, mm -hmm. you know, because the English clubs were banned after what happened in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Hazel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this was a very, very good team. And after 90 minutes, it's nil-nil. We go into a penalty shootout. Okay, we lose the penalty shootout. But that day, you know, something was born. There was this, this uh, uh, spirit. Uh, there was this... Um, what is very important is that players trust each other and we had that. And we had, you know, we had Trevor Hartley. Trevor Hartley was one of the, one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but he instilled this uh, amongst us was like, you know, we are one. You know, we, we, are not, we are not a bunch of individuals. We are one. And like I said, after playing Everton, nil-nil after 90 minutes, nobody was going to stop us. Uh, we had a bit of a scare in the group stages when we, I think we played the Philippines. And if P. Ravindran had not scored in like the 88th or 89th minute, you know, it would have been a one-all draw. 
But yes, we had, you know, in a tournament like that, you have one game where, you know, it, it can, up, can be an upset. So we managed that. And after that, you know, it was, and to win the SEA Games gold medal, you know, in pouring rain in front of 45,000 people in Merdeka Stadium. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, that is just unbelievable. You know, I've got, I've got goosebumps right now uh, talking about that. Yeah, that, that was indeed a team. And you did mention about Trevor Hartley. So, uh, is there any funny memories about him? You said he was a funny guy. Uh, yeah, he, he was, well, you know, he, <laughs> yeah. he, he, he was funny. Uh, I, I've got to tell you this, right? So, uh, uh, on the on the morning of the final, right? On the morning of the final, um, okay. you know, I I I'm having a chat with him, and he says he he says write down who do you think should start, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, I wrote down who I thought he would pick, you know, and then he looks at 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 the team and he says I played our most creative midfielders in the semifinals against Thailand, and Thailand dominated the game. And I thought, hang on a minute, you know, <laughs> you know, you never stop learning. Yeah. And 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 at night, I mean, the midfield uh, trio was uh, Tiong Kim, Madzan Madaris, and Ahmad Yusuf. And I'm mm -hmm. telling you, that three man midfield, wow, oh, one of the best I've played with. And oh. uh, and I suppose that uh, apart from, I mean, the Sea Games, of course, would have been one of the highlight of your international career. The other maybe would have been that match against England, 1991. Uh, yeah, for me, that was memorable because that was my last uh, international game. Mm, um, I see, I see. I, I, it was 1991. I was 31. And uh, I stopped, uh, stopped enjoying, uh, you know, that, that non-stop uh, football. And obviously, there were some changes, you know. Uh, after Trevor left, you know, there were some changes in, in the coaches. And, and uh, you know, I... I I thought, you know what, it's not going to get any bigger than this. No, you always want one to, to like, you know, bow out on, on mm -hmm. one know, last hurrah. One last hurrah, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Gary Lineker scored four. <laughs> and, uh, but we will always remember Matlan Marjan for scoring two yeah, against, yeah, yeah. you know, against England. Don't forget England was semi finalists in the World Cup one year yes. before that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm not enjoying it anymore. Uh, so that was it. I, I never, never went. I was asked to come back uh, once or twice, but I decided no. You know, I, I, I think I dedicated enough time to my country, mm -hmm. uh, even though I will go on to play until I was 36. But at 31, I played my last international. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay. Which comes to the next question. So can I say England's the toughest opponent you have played against and why? Or any other particular, maybe Gary Lineker is a hard man for you? Well, I mean, Gary Lineker, you know, were absolutely world-class. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, like, you know, that is a different level. Uh, we had some ding-dong battles against South Korea, against Japan. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can say that, you know, that was... Uh, that was one of the toughest games I played in. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, throughout your career, I mean, didn't you had any, I mean, I'm sure you had a desire to go play overseas, but did any of this opportunity came knocking on your door? Well, to be honest, I was almost on the brink of uh, going for a training stint in uh, Swansea City. Mm. Uh, at that time, John Toshek was the manager and uh, mm. Mr. S. Subramaniam, uh, technical director of KLFA at that time, Mr. Subra, you know, he had been with the AFC for so many years. And I mean, like, you know, he had like contacts all over the world, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I was almost going to go. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, John Toshek got the sack. And then, uh, you know, the plans just fell through. So, um, you never know what would have happened. Yeah. Would we? <laughs> yep, 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 correct, correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, that brings us to the end of our first segment. And after this, we're going to move into Blackburn Rovers. Stay tuned. Dalam usaha melancarkan serangan mereka. Hanya satu minit selepas jaringan Sadin Osman. Wan Rashid telah pun menyiapkan whistle penamat. Dengan itu, Kuala Lumpur sekali lagi muncul sebagai juara Piala Malaysia 1989 untuk kali ketiga berturut-turut.
Hi, welcome back to the Bola Bola show. So, uh, as Sivan said earlier, we'll be continuing uh, next episode with the Blackburn Rovers. Uh, well, Blackburn Rovers is the first club actually I supported as a, as a teenager. So, there's lots, a lot of uh, love there actually after, after they supported Juventus. So, why I'm starting Blackburn is basically you had a team there with Blackburn as a global director. And uh, it did never turn out well. It didn't turn out well for to, for the for your travel, for the journey. So, uh, can you just let us know why the Blackburn project didn't turn out well, and was it lack of support from the backroom staff or management, or is there anything else behind the scene? Well, uh, first of all, let, let me uh, let me clarify this. You know, uh, I had, uh, the owners of Blackburn Rovers, the Venkies, had gotten in touch with me in uh, 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had gone to work for them. Uh, you know, uh, to do football development in India for, yeah. for Blackman Rovers. Um, every third week, I would travel. Uh, I would I will travel uh, to, to Mumbai. The car would pick me up. I'll go to Pune. And, you know, and, and I started uh, uh, little leagues. Uh, um, I, I, I think we had about three or four little leagues going on. Okay. Uh, so it was pretty much to raise the profile of Blackman Rovers in India. And um, so... Um, Blackburn Rovers came to India to play a friendly game. Uh, at this at this time, I'm I'm just doing football uh, development for Blackburn Rovers in India, and okay. um, and then the the club you know gets relegated the the same season, yeah. uh, and then uh, the Venkis asked me you know if 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 I, if I could go there, so I said yeah. So I had a two year contract. So end of my first year, uh, the second year I went to to Blackburn. Um, I wouldn't say there was a project because absolutely no clue is what the club had. The club didn't have any playing philosophy. The Mm -hmm. club didn't have any concrete plans. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much like, you know, you know, today you start work, today you're trying to chart uh, the future of the club, you know, from the first team through to, 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 to the kids, you know. You know, and obviously, you know, so you are battling on a lot of fronts, you know. So okay. I, I would say that, you know, of immediate concern, I mean, I broke up uh, the plans into three. One was the, the immediate term, okay. uh, one was the midterm, and one was the, uh, one was the short term, and one was the long term uh, plan, mm-hmm. right? Um, so in the immediate term, we needed to have players who could take the club back into the Premier League. Because this is the dynamics of football. If you are relegated, you don't make it back up straight away. You know you're going to struggle. Hmm. So, so it was pretty much, you know, uh, doing a lot of things. Uh, but unfortunately, there were a lot of forces at the club, in the club, outside the club, that were pulling in, in different directions, you know. So it was, it was always about, you know, about... Uh, undermining you, you know, whatever you're trying to do, uh, people will try to undermine you, people, you know, so it was a lot of turmoil. And unfortunately, you know, when you have the owners who are like thousands of, of miles away, uh, you know, there's always a communication a lapse, you know, and in these lapses is when, you know, things would be turned upside down, would be turned on the head. I mean, to be honest, right, there were too many, um, too many little Napoleons uh, at the club. Mm-hmm. You know, the club being successful was going to be detrimental to a lot of individuals. You know, they, they, they created this uh, perpetual, um, you know, horror show about, about the club. Even if you were doing well, you know, it was always about the negativity. And uh, so finally, when push came to shove, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I... I I decided that, you know, why would I want to be involved in, in a situation like that, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never had a high regard for football hierarchy. You know, I mean, we've seen what happens uh, in, in Malaysia with the, with the associations and everybody. And at the football club, you know, they're supposed to be like, you know, uh, in, in, in a big league, you know. In, in, I mean, it was all, I think, I, perhaps I was there for a reason. The reason was for me to realize, you know, that, you know what, this is how it works. You know, this is how, you know, toxic it is. 
Mm. You know, all the bitching, the backbiting and all that. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I was brought up to be very independent. Um, and at the end of the day, if, they, if there was a project, it, it never materialized. And hence, ha, henceforth, you know, you can see, you know, that uh, things just got from bad to worse. So, you know, Chevy, you know, if you have a time machine, okay, let's say, you know, Doc Brown from Back to the Future gave you the keys to the DeLorean car, okay, and uh, asked you to go back in time, you know, how different would you have managed your role, you know, now compared to last time at Blackburn? No, I, 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 if I could go back into time, I wouldn't mm. go there. <laughs> okay. Not, okay. not that season. No, no. Okay. Hang on. I haven't finished yet. All right. Not that season. You know, mm -hmm. that first season of relegation, I wouldn't go there. I would change the timing. I would go the season after. Because then, you know, everything would have settled. Uh, you know, all every, you know, all, all the turmoil and everything would have settled. Mm -hmm. So I, I would only change that. I wouldn't change anything that I did in there, but I would just change the timing of it. So... I got there when they got relegated. No, I would, I would wait for one more season and then I would go there. And today, God willing, we would be in the Premier League. Okay, okay. okay. And so timing, yeah, I would. Yeah, sure. you, you gave me a time machine, I changed the timing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and perhaps, perhaps who knows, Blackburn's time these days would have, been, would have changed for the better. I mean, we wouldn't know that. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, these days, uh, as what Bala mentioned, you know, they got relegated and they are still playing in the championship. You know, it's a far cry from their days as a, a perennial Premier League side. Um, of course, you know, these days, there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, I don't know, somewhat issues or anything, when, especially with regards to foreign ownership it, with European clubs. And Blackburn Rovers is one of those clubs that doesn't escape from that conversation. Um, would you say that, you know, the, the Venkis or, I mean, have, I mean, are they part of the problem or maybe it's just that the team didn't involve as per current times? Well, to be honest, I, I think, you know, um, you need to understand football uh, if you want uh, to invest in it as a business, mm -hmm. right? I mean, no disrespect to anyone. I absolutely adore what Tan Sri Vincent Tan is, what Tan Sri Tony Fernandez is, but you look at their football clubs. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Yep, yep. You need to understand football to invest in football as a business. If you just invest as a business, then you're going to be, you know, going to be given the runaround. So, you know, likewise uh, with Blackburn Rovers. Okay. All right. That's a pretty, very straightforward and good answer. Okay, guys. Any other question? Voila. Well, uh, you sure you got something about Blackburn? Yeah, a lot. But uh, I think I think one thing because uh, another thing was between uh, Dagley, oh, sorry, between the owner, Jack Walker and Wenke. What, what separates them in terms of, is it is it passion or is it business? I think. Uh, we have seen like uh, even Chelsea was bought over by the by Roman well, uh, Abramovich. Abramovich, Abramovich yeah. yeah, and where the club is now, the Champions League winner. Forget about sacking, but the club somewhere. But why is it Venki guys? They thought because one of the thing was funny. I think they wanted to sign Ronaldinho when it was peak to Blackburn, and also they wanted to sign Diego Maradona as part of the manager club. So is it just only lack of knowledge, or just they took it as a, maybe okay? I'm just like a rich boy game, and just for the fun of it, they do it. Well, to be honest, right, um, you know Prince Harry? Hmm. Prince Harry, I think over the past week, yeah. made a comment about the, the media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. That's how they are. I mean, if they can do it to their own royal, what yeah, about yeah. outsiders, you know? What, what, what about, you know, people who come from, you know, a, a different culture, a different country, Mm -hmm. uh, people who come from a country where you know cricket is the number one sport, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. there is a huge culture of mockery. You know, they mock uh, you, and uh, and you know, they look down upon you. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you know, when they they find that, hang on a minute, you know, this person knows something 
they will do their very best to destroy you. Okay. Yeah. So you got to be very careful. That there's a very toxic culture. You look at the media. You know. Yeah. 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 Lucky Pep Guardiola didn't get the sack when Man City started the season badly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. correct. You, I mean, you, so so you see, you know, so 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 there's a lot of uh, you know people with with strange uh, upbringings, perhaps you know that that influence how they write, how, how they think. So it's, it's, a, a, it's a totally different thing. It's a totally different thing, you know. Mm. It's like, it's your money, but it's our club. No, life doesn't work like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, we'll end this segment on Blackburn Rovers. And coming up next, we will talk with uh, Mr. Shabby Singh on his television career. So stay tuned. Okay, welcome back, guys. And uh, okay, Shabby, you know, you were one of the earliest uh, local football pundits on Astro when they got their rights to broadcast the Premier League back in the late 90s, you know. So, how did your career in TV get started? Yep, uh, September 1997. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you, so, you know how many years I've been on TV now? Wow. <laughs> years right. yeah. But unfortunately, nobody has named their child after me yet. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, I I retired end of 96. And mm-hmm. uh, I was I was helping out a friend of mine. You know, he'd given me a job uh, and I was helping him out because he was involved in the um, the building of uh, the Commonwealth Stadiums. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So, I was just helping him out. And then one day, his younger brother comes into the office and he says, uh, this is on a Monday. And he says, oh, you know, did you watch Man United v Liverpool? I'm like, no. Why oh, well, you didn't watch it? I said, it wasn't on TV. He said, no, it was on TV. I said, no, RTM, TV3, nobody showed it. He said, it's on Astro. I didn't even know Astro had come into town. Mm, okay. All right. <laughs> and he was like, yes. oh, you know, Shabby, you must do this. You know, they had, a, they had a, the studio. They were talking about football. They had so-and-so. You must do this, you know. So I was, and you know what? He goes downstairs. He gets the, his Astro bill from the car. And he tells me, call this number. So I call. Okay, and this is a true story. I call and I said, can you put me through to the sports uh, department? And then somebody picks up the phone and I say, I'm so-and-so. And, and, uh, you know, I would be very interested to talk to somebody uh, regarding the football on the weekend. And uh, this person goes like, oh, um, actually, the person in charge is away. Uh, I'll get her to call you on Friday. All right. And then Friday, I get this call from uh, this lady and she says that... uh, uh, you know, um, could I come in on the Saturday? And this is like Friday mid-morning. She said, oh, come in on a Saturday, you know. Uh, and then uh, we'll do a show. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And then at 5 o'clock on Friday, she calls me and she says, oh, uh, can you drop by the office, you know. Uh, I think it was Liverpool playing someone. She was like, you know, she like had these printouts and everything. And I'm there thinking like, I know everything about these teams, but never mind. So she gave me this brown envelope, you know, I never even looked at the notes <laughs> that she printed out. And Saturday I was on the show. They said, come back the following Saturday. I came back the following Saturday. After the second Saturday, the, this gentleman, uh, John McDonald, he said, oh, uh, what are you doing lunchtime Tuesday? I said, mm, nothing. And he said, okay, come over, you know. So on that Tuesday, I walk into his office and he shuts the door. He locks in and he says, you're not leaving until you sign a contract. Oh. John McDonald, bless him wherever he is. And that was the beginning of um, a very, very long <laughs> um, television career, I would say. Mm-hmm. So that was how it all started. So I quit my job mm-hmm. and uh, I just started work on television. And uh, being on television, uh, along the way, I helped build... Uh, you know, uh, a, a few brands as well who wanted to be associated with the English Premier League. After four years, uh, four seasons, Astro Supersport lost the rights. Uh, ESPN got the rights. 
So here I was, uh, kind of like jobless. So I rang up Steve Darby. Uh, Steve Darby used to coach in Malaysia. If you guys would know that name, yes, because Darby, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'd seen, yeah. yeah. So I rang him and I said, you know, Dabs, is there any possibility of work in Singapore? So he said, oh yeah, you know, I'll uh, I'll put a word in. Um, I get a phone call from uh, Mr. John Dykes mm, uh, asking okay. me if I could go in, uh, you know, for for an audition. He said, uh, yeah, you know, it's not so much of an audition. We just want to put you on camera. So I went uh, to Singapore. I had, a, we did a 10-minute uh, commentary, I, you know, and then we did a five-minute studio thing with John Dykes. And um, before the week was out, you know, I was uh, told that I was sent a, a roster on which days I was working. And that was it. Mm, okay. They can't get rid of me now. <laughs> that's a that's a joke. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, okay. In, in what aspect do you think? Uh, I mean, of course, you know, a lot of ex-professional football players, uh, basically, you know, many of them go into television uh, as part of their uh, retirement career. Um, yeah. What would what would what are the aspects do you think that they need to learn and adapt when they're embarking on a career in television? Well. Uh, I would say that, you know, to, to these uh, players, if when they were playing, if somebody had said to them, pandai baca game, then you have a chance <laughs> hmm, <okay. laughs> to analyze football <laughs> matches. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to have a deep understanding of the game. You know, knowledge of the game is one thing. Understanding of the game is another. You know, knowledge is telling me, you know, who has won, you know, how many cups or titles or whatever. But the understanding of the game, you know, uh, like uh, you guys posed that question to me, why today there's no libero? Because football has evolved, you know. And you have always got to be ahead uh, of, of, uh, of football. You've always got to be able to see where football is going to be in the next five years, in, in, in 10 years, you know. I mean, you look at, uh, for, as an example, you look at Pep Guardiola, right? Mm -hmm. He's, he knows, you know, people, opponents are going to do nothing but defend against his teams. I'm not going to say which team, against his teams. So mm -hmm. when opponents are defending deep, you know, defenders are always big, cumbersome, yep. you know. Solid. And midfielders are all, you know, hard-running battlers. So what do you do? You need to cultivate the little, small, tricky, technically gifted player so that you can go through these, you know, these tall blocks of defenders and play through them and, you know, and use your, your low center of gravity. You look at David Silva, Bernardo Silva, for example, right? I mean, you look at Gundogan for, for that matter. So, so football evolves in that, you know. And that is why if you attack City and you, you know, you start playing uh, old school English football, you know you will trouble them from set pieces and everything because they don't have enough... Uh, tall players to challenge you uh, to, 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 to win the physical game. But this is how it evolves, you know. So, so you need, like I said, you know, you want to be a good football analyst, you know. You need to be ahead of the game. And that, you know, is, is something that does not come naturally. Everybody can talk about the game, right? Everybody discusses the game, you know. But to be able to understand the game is one thing. All right, okay. Uh, those were the days when 1998, we, me and Elvin and Simon used to come back uh, from our colleges or from workplace so that we can catch up on the football focus during uh, evening. So it's yeah, one, yeah, one of the exciting yeah. time. Yes, Tuesday, yes. <laughs> Tuesday. So it's one of the excitement, excitement time for us and we, we usually uh, see John Dykes having a jab with you and together the stick my mind and all stuff. So um, what were the were some of your most memorable moments that you remember being a pundit on TV? Particularly the workers, but I'm sure I've plenty. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there were a lot, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I, um, I, I would say that, you know, um, I, 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 I think, you know, that t till today, you know, people remember me saying that Steven Gerrard, you know, uh, would have been a great fullback, you uh, know, we're, we're because to come to that because <laughs> yeah, because at that time, you know, he was a headless chicken running around in midfield. He was strong. He was powerful. But he always was um, overrated at, at that time, in my opinion, because if you remember, Didi Haman was there to like, 
you know, control things in midfield. Uh, Xabi Alonso, you know, heck, even Javier Mascherano, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was during that period, you know, where I thought, you know, this is a situation, you know, where I think you can best utilize him in, in, a, in a right back position. England weren't blessed with right full backs, you know. I mean, let's not talk about Gary Neville. Um, so so it, was, it, it was then, okay, so now fast forward so many years and you guys tell me, right, you guys tell me, what is the profile of a right fullback? He's powerful. He Bank can run right, up yes. and down. He can take players on. He can put good crosses in. He can even cut inside and, and have a shot at goal. Was that not what Steven Gerrard was like? So this is about how football evolves, you know. I'm right. going to share this, this story with you. I recently did a generation gap where we, were, uh, we selected the best Liverpool and Man United 11. Hmm. I had David Beckham at right back and Ryan Giggs at left back. Wow. And this, this guy, this other person on the show called me a lunatic. But then again, you know, this is the profile of the modern day fullback. Right? The last 10 years, the modern day fullback, you know, it's totally different. It's not your boring Gary Neville anymore, you know. Uh, like right now, present day, today, Ashraf Hakimi, watch Ashraf yeah. Hakimi, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's, yeah. it's, it, it was for Borussia Dortmund or it's uh, for Inter Milan. Yeah. Wow, you know. And if he had a left foot, he would be like a Ryan Giggs. He's got a right foot, he's, he's, uh, he's like a David Beckham. So, so, so the roles and responsibilities uh, of uh, uh, certain positions evolve as, as uh, football, football evolves uh, itself. So it's not that your 442, your 442, 442 go to hell 442 anymore. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> football has evolved so much. So maybe, you know, I was ahead of my time. But you look at certain players and then you say, if he could play in that position. And that is where I, you know, I always like to bring up this example of Pep Guardiola. Joshua Kimmich at Bayern Munich was a right fullback. Pep Guardiola turned him into a world-class central midfielder. Because you look at players, you look at the strengths and you look at uh, uh, certain uh, roles on the pitch and you find that you, know, you can move players around. So there you have it. Hmm, okay. Yep. Uh, we were we wanted to get into that uh, Steven Gerrard's position at right back, but uh, no, I've already for, explained it. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. I think uh, perhaps, uh, today. Yeah. It makes a great headline, isn't it? Well, you know, uh, the funny thing is, uh, you was, know, uh, the John you know, when 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 I said one day, Paul Pogba is going to be a world champion, and this is before the 2018 World Cup, nobody remembers that. But I told you, Paul Pogba is a world champion. I said he was going to be a world champion one day. Mm -hmm. But no, that's not the story, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, recently John Dykes, John Dykes was tweeting uh, some, some uh, throwback stuff, on, particularly on the football focus. So he mentioned this was one, one particular of the most memorable moment of the episode. Yeah. But, well, but for me, in, in fact, you know, I would say, you know, football focus has always been a very fo football education. But I mean, with you, John Dykes, Paul Maysfield and all the other guys, you know, it's always been interesting yeah. getting feedback. And I think there was one other memorable opinion that I remember you gave was the comparison between uh, Momo Sissoko and Javier Mascherano, which I think uh, we, we still remember oh. it today that you, you didn't quite like the idea oh. of being... How did, how did Momo Sissoko ever, ever wear a Liverpool shirt? <laughs> he, you know, I, I, I mean, he was, well, I already used that phrase, right? Like, like a headless chicken. This guy, he had the, like, the poorest touch I've ever seen. As bad as uh, Kelechi Ihe Nacho. <laughs> His touch was so poor, he, you know, and, and how did he ever become a Liverpool player is, is beyond me. Totally beyond me. Was well, it a strategy by what is at the time was uh, what is his name? The Liverpool coach, Spanish Rafa, guy, Rafa, uh, Rafa Benitez. Is it some kind of, uh, you know, stop this playmaker, whatever is it? No, no. <laughs> I think that was just, you know, somebody doctored the videos and sent them to Benitez and Benitez signed him. 
<laughs> I mean, honestly, that kind of stuff does go on in football, but no way, no way. I mean, you know, he, you know, as a central midfielder, your first touch, it doesn't matter if you're a defensive midfielder. Heck, even Gennaro Gattuso had a better first touch. Mascherano, world class, you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was one that totally baffled me. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, Shemi, I just wanted to ask you something about Asian football because I know that you do a lot of uh, punditry on the uh, AFC Champions League. How, where is Asian football today as compared to, say, you know, 10, 20 years ago? I mean, do you think that it is that we are, that we are catching up with, say, I mean, obviously the best continent is still Europe. We are catching up to that level or is it still, you know, touch and go in, in, depending on one game and you know, something like that? I think, you know, um, as individuals, I think you look at the Japanese, the Koreans, you know, they are able to adapt uh, to the top leagues in, in, in Europe. But if you put a team together, you know, if you put the South Korean team, for example, you know, they will always uh, lose uh, to, to, to the European teams or to the South American teams. So I think we are making steps, you know, first of all, the individuals have got to make, uh, you know, build reputations for themselves overseas. Uh, and then slowly, when you have enough people playing overseas, enough Koreans, enough Japanese to come back and form a very, very good national team, then we will be able to see uh, progress. So at this moment in time, uh, part one uh, of the progress is the individuals. They are beginning uh, to, to adapt to Europe, you know, to, to even make name, uh, rep- build reputations for themselves in Europe. But collectively, as groups, it's not enough uh, South Koreans to come together to form a formidable uh, Korean team or a formidable uh, Japanese team. So, so aspect uh, number one, individually, we are making strides. Number two, no, we're still far behind. Mm-hmm. And what about the club competition? I mean, do you find that today, I mean, AFC clubs have evolved so much, becoming more professional in how their day-to-day runnings and all that? I think you can, yeah, you, you can see that. I mean, there is, uh, there is uh, progress, you know, in uh, uh, the quality of uh, the game. You know, there's progress in, in, uh, in terms of uh, development of players. You know, the, the, um, Asia, I mean, I pretty much talk about Japan and Korea. It's not a retirement ground anymore for, mm-hmm. uh, for, for, for foreign, foreign players, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you got to be uh, at your peak if you want to play in, in, uh, in uh, South Korea or Japan. Or if you want to play in the Asian Champions League. You, you, you know, you cannot have, you know, come here and think, all right, you know, uh, you know I, I've come here, I'm retired now. I'll just make some money and then I'll, you know, kick a ball around. I'll go home. No, it doesn't happen. So the standard is definitely uh, much higher. And yes, some of the games in the Asian Champions League are of very, very high quality. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So guys, any other question? Yeah, you know, uh, Shemi, you know, you being an excellent reader of the game or, you know, dear Pandai Bacha game, okay, you know, are there, are there any plans uh, from you to get into football management perhaps? Uh, no, um, because I, I would say that, you know, that, yeah, I did. I actually got my uh, FAM C license, my coaching license, C license okay. in uh, 1995. Uh, but I was still playing at 1996. Obviously, the plan, the idea, you know, with Mr. S. Subramaniam's encouragement was like I would go into coaching one day. Uh, but television uh, came, you know, uh, came into my, my, my life. And uh, ever since then, I've worked on and off. I mean, I did a reality show on television called My Team. Yes. Really uh, nice. you, know, I, I, yes. Uh, you know, the, uh, the spin offs have been good. I mean, I worked as the. Uh, as a global advisor uh, to uh, the Vankies, to Blackburn Rovers, you know. Uh, I was a um, consultant uh, to uh, an advisor to TMJ uh, with JDT for, for a year and a half. So, so along the way, I have, you know, um, had, uh, I would say, taken on other responsibilities as well. Yeah. But to go into full-time management, to go into full-time coaching, no, I'm not interested, you know. Uh, one day your club Spurs come and offer you a job or something. 
You support Spurs, right? Yeah, I, I am. I am a Spurs supporter, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah. I. I mean, honestly, if a, a super rich billionaire came and said, you know, I want you to do this for me, I would. I, I mean, I would. I, I. I would drop, you know, television. I would drop everything and and go try to run a club, a manager club. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that unless you know it was a really viable project. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. So coaching per se, no. But if you want me to build a club for you, I I I can do that. I'm sure you guys can put all your money together and we can buy a club. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> How wish we could. <laughs> hey, don't you know if if you've got three hundred fifty thousand euros, you tell me I'll I'll get you a club in Portugal. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 don't think about millions. Okay. <laughs> not, not all clubs are worth that amount of money. <laughs> But uh, you know, you have to convert to ringgit, so it becomes million. Ah, uh, it does. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> all right. Uh, for my part, uh, Shelby, thanks for uh, attending Bola Bola Show. Uh, I know there's a delay, but uh, anyhow, we really appreciate your time here. But uh, I would like to uh, talk about my team uh, project. I think it's a very controversial yet an interesting concept of the show, like earlier mentioned. So we would like to know what's the actual motive of this team. Actually, is it to show that the Malaysian League uh, play we have a lot of players, or is it to show something is wrong with the team? Or what? Well, kind of to, to be okay, I know, um, and you could get it from the horse's mouth. Uh, <laughs> I was approached. Uh, you know, I was by, approached uh, by someone, and they said that you know uh, there was a, a plan to do a football reality show, right? So they presented the plan to me, and I thought, bloody hell, this is good because at that time there was an objective, because you know widely it was circulated by FAM that there was no talent in Malaysia, mm-hmm. all right? So there was an objective was to say no, no. There is a lot of talent. You only don't know how to look for it. So the only way to do that was to go out there and show people how it's done. So you must understand it was not a develop football development program. It was a reality TV show. It was you know it was uh, also indirectly to show that there is talent and talent if it is um, it is spotted it is uh, developed you know. You know, you you can play in front of ninety uh, thousand people, mm-hmm. so so that was the objective, and I said, yeah, you know, I, I would love to do that. So for two seasons we did that, two thousand six, two thousand seven. Ah, but today you couldn't do a show like that because you know you would need to have a, a strong objective. So at that time was like, no, we have talent. It's just that you guys are not doing the uh, the right. Things to, to 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 look for it and to develop it. All right. Okay. Yeah. So do Do you think that NFDP has sort of addressed that problem that you were mentioning earlier in terms of looking for talent? Well, to be honest, right? Uh, the NFDP started off, um, which was uh, for me. I thought you know it's a it's a it's a good plan. It's a good idea, but it narrowed its objectives. The objective was to qualify. For the under 17 World Cup, right? Yeah, it was not to develop footballers who would one day go on to become professional footballers. It was just to qualify for one specific competition. Mm-hmm. So that, for me, is wrong. Uh, as an example, we take Lukman Hakim, right? He's a wonderful talent. He's gone to Europe at the age of 18. He should have gone to Europe. At the age of fourteen, when he was fourteen with NFDP, they should have got, they should have gotten him to live in Europe, and say that you know this young kid you know is one day going to grow into a top top class footballer, but they didn't do that. So they develop a team, a group of players. Uh, they didn't achieve the objective, and you know people you know jumped on them like a ton of bricks. So once again, you know, when you do a, a a a program like that, the whole idea would have been to develop highly talented individuals, not 
try to qualify for a specific uh, a tournament because that's what development is all about mm-hmm. okay all right so along the way you know you can change you can evolve you can uh, you know you can um, you 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 can adopt new ideas as well but if you go with a with a set mind you will fail mm. all right all right okay Alvin, what about you any last questions i uh, know i just want to thank uh, thank shabby you know for coming on board and spending time with us and you know really giving us lots of insights you know on your career and everything shabby thank you so much yep. a pleasure indeed Thank yeah. you so much, yeah. gentlemen. You take yeah. care. And uh, if I don't get invited back, I will know that I was not good. Guys, guys, stay you... safe and always, always don't lose your sense of humor. Yes, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, tr- truly, truly enjoyed this conversation with you. It's been. Fun knowledge and also very humorous as well along the process. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for being our guest. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, with that said, we will end this week's episode of the Bola Bola Show. Goodbye for now.